welcome to Addicted to Murder. This is Courtney, licensed professional counselor with over a decade of experience. And this is Trisha, and Diane Downs was a bit of a bantling. Oh, was she? Yes, a spoiled brat. Definitely. I mean, not necessarily by her parents, but... And maybe not as a child. Right, but she became difficult Yes. to work with. So. And we'll learn all about that all right. today. Good thing. But first, I have a question. Oh, okay. What's that? So, we are going into a time of year where sort of our our jobs change a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, But thinking as the main heavy part of our our jobs is sort of coming to an end right now, what is the first thing that you do when you get home from work each day? Like after a normal work day? Yes. Okay. Because, yeah, like you said, we're on summer break, so... (laughs) (laughs) Um, well, you know what I used to want to do is have a drink of wine, like a Mm. glass of wine was my first thing, but I don't do that anymore. Um, I get home and I just play with my dog. And if Chris is home, I play with Chris. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, just like, cause that will instantly make me feel better Mm -hmm. if I was stressed out on my way home or something like that. Right. Makes sense. What do you do? Mine is fairly similar. Yeah. I... Either pick up my dog from daycare on the way home, or I let her out of her crate when I get home. So playing with my dog is usually the first thing I do, Mm -hmm. because she demands it, and she's adorable. Mm -hmm. And then I usually take off my shoes, because I hate shoes. Mm. And then usually go into kind of prepping dinner pretty quickly. Transition quite quick. You don't sit down for a while. Well, if I sit down for a while, I might not want to get back up and make dinner. That's true. Mm -hmm. If I don't make dinner right away, then dinner's not till seven or eight. Exactly. So I get that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Now, though, it's like I don't even remember to eat breakfast till lunchtime because I'm not (laughs) on a schedule right now. (laughs) Ah. So, like, I'm one of those people that do need, like, work Mm -hmm. just to keep me. Otherwise, yeah, I lose a lot of time doing nothing. Got it. But I do enjoy time off, though. I'm not going to lie about that. Same. I have enjoyed not having much to do this week. Yeah. Although I wish that my animals realized that I did not have much to do this week because we have still been getting up. Yeah. Nice and bright and early. One of these days, maybe she'll sleep late. Maybe. Mulder's pretty good about it. He can go like 12 hours without having to go potty. Rika can go that long without having to go potty. She just really likes attention so yeah. when as soon as she wakes up she wants me to also be awake mm. with her makes sense so well thanks for that question you're welcome we're on part two of diane downs yes we are lady die d-i-e that was one of the <laughs> monikers i saw oh yeah because i mean she did have a princess diana haircut at the time it's true she did uh-huh so that was one of the things that might be what mm. i call these episodes um you know, how mm. I, how we put what their name is and then their moniker or whatever. Right. It might be mm-hmm. that one. But yeah, that was one I saw. <laughs> nice. I like it. <laughs> Clever. Do you want to give a little recap? Yeah. So last week we learned all about Elizabeth Diane Downs. Well, it wasn't Downs at the time, mm-hmm. but, and how she was born in Arizona to teenage parents who did not really have the emotional capacity to raise an emotionally sensitive child and so her life when she was young was very lonely and she didn't have a lot of friends didn't really fit in anywhere so she also experienced some pretty horrible abuse at the hands of her father both physical and sexual and got married to the first man who showed her any positive attention That didn't work out so well, so she decided that to find that love that she so desperately needed, she was going to have a baby. Mm -hmm. And so she did. So yeah, we left off with the birth of Diane's first child, Christy. She wrote this in a later correspondence. Quote, "I I finally found true love and peace with another human being, my daughter. While Christy grew inside me, I knew for the first time in my life that I was needed, really needed. I finally had a reason to exist, and I was happy, truly happy. And after my child was born, I was even happier because now I wasn't the only one in love. Christy, too, loved me. 
Well, even though Diane was thrilled with her new daughter, it didn't improve her and Steve's marriage. The couple were still only teenagers at this time. Diane claims that Steve did not have patience for child rearing and he had odd work hours that he expected Diane to work around. She claimed that he was a jealous husband. If he thought someone was looking at her wrong, he would take it out on her by abusing her at home. Diane had a job, not the one that she still dreamed of, you know, being a doctor, um, but she did have a job. One day, Diane got a wild idea and she just up and joined the Air Force. Diane left her six-month-old baby with Steve while she did basic training. She only lasted three weeks before she was discharged and sent home because of pretty severe blisters. Courtney, any thoughts on what I just went over? You know, Diane was smart and ambitious and was likely drawn to the idea of being a doctor, at least in part because it would put her in a position of power. But she'd been kicked out of college, and going to medical school as a woman with a baby was virtually unheard of at the time. But being in the military, there was an opportunity to gain power by moving up the ranks, or to receive training as a medic, for example, which she could then translate to a career in medicine. But Diane was also impulsive, and joining the military is not something that should be done impulsively. I don't think she was ready or willing to put in the actual effort needed. Yeah, I thought it was bizarre. I mean, here she is just so enraptured with her baby she just had, knowing that Steve wasn't going to be a good dad as far as taking care of it, and then just ups and leaves to basic training, which, you know, yeah, it only lasted three weeks, but if she had gone through with it, she could have been gone for years. Right. It was such a bizarre thing for her to do. But right. that just goes and shows you, you know, how she thinks. Diane and Steve were wrestling one day, like not abusive wrestling. They were playing around and wrestling and she hit her head badly enough for her to lose consciousness. Diane said her doctor advised her to get off birth control pills because of the concussion symptoms she had been experiencing since, you know, this accident. So she did. Um, Sometimes Steve would send Diane to go stay with her parents for a while. Then she would come back with the baby. It was like a constant tug of war between what she wanted and what her family told her to do. But despite all the upheaval, Diane and Steve got pregnant again. So, yeah, Steve would, like, kick her out sometimes when he had to change jobs or if he was, she was just, like, being too much for him. And then she'd go live with her parents who she didn't want to live with. And they'd get sick of her and send her back to Steve. And it was just this constant back and forth with the baby. So, yeah, she got pregnant again. And Steve, again, was not happy with the news. They were pretty poor at this time. And another baby was just creating more expenses to cover. Steve felt Diane had tricked him into having another baby as she had the first. He declared that this would be their last baby, so she better have a boy. Well, Cheryl Lynn Downs was born. And unlike Christy, who was an easy baby, Cheryl was not. She was colicky from the get-go. Suffice it to say, the already strained couple became more volatile with a constantly screaming, unhappy baby in the house. Steve promptly got a vasectomy. There would be no more babies in the Downs household. But what Steve neglected to do was go back the few weeks after the procedure to be sure it was a success. And Diane got pregnant again. Of course, you know, Steve accused Diane of being unfaithful. But when he went back to the doctors, they confirmed that the vasectomy did not take. So they did the vasectomy again. Per Diane, in a later interview by local news affiliate KEZI, quote, I was 20 years old. I had two kids. My parents were pressuring me to, pressuring me to potty train Christy. Cheryl was colicky. My husband was a bastard. I couldn't take one more pressure. I decided to have an abortion. I might have had another Cheryl. The baby wouldn't have been loved. Diane went ahead and had the abortion. Diane would leave Steve sometime later. She was extremely unhappy and seemingly adrift, not really feeling like she had much control over her life. Although she was financially dependent on Steve, she decided to go to Texas to stay with an uncle um, with her babies. That lasted a whole week before Diane begged Steve to come and get her or or for her to go home. Courtney, what do you think is going on mentally with Diane at this state? Do you have enough information to interpret all of her jumping around, randomly joining the Air Force, spontaneously having abortion, moving out, then moving back, etc.? I think that Diane was clearly unhappy with her life and was searching for a, quote, easy fix to her feelings. She'd hoped that getting married would fix it, and then having a baby, and then the Air Force, 
then another baby, then leaving Steve. But when the real problem is inside of you, when you have no self-esteem, when you are hurt and broken, no external thing will be able to fix it. She is still searching for those feelings of unconditional love, belonging, and power, just like she did when she was a kid. This brings up a good point. So if you are in the situation that Diane's in, I mean, not this necessarily the same situation, but from a, a upbringing, the way she she was brought up and the feelings that she's having, what do you do to fix that? Like, is this, a, I mean, is this therapy? Is this like self-work? Like, what should Diane have done besides, you know, doing what she did? Coming from your therapy perspective. Yeah. So I think some kind of, of self-work, whether that's therapy or religion or whatever it is that, you know, you believe in and that helps you, but something that, you know, lets you work through the feelings you have about your trauma, something that helps you build self-esteem and self-understanding, you know, something that makes you, I mean, in her case, she didn't have a chance to sort of individuate. So something that lets you explore who you really are Mm -hmm. and try and figure that out. Because until you can figure that out and really be okay with yourself, you know, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be totally healed to like have a happy relationship or something. Meaning she went from her parents to Steve, never was on her own. When you say individuate. And yes. And had kids, so then that was part of her. Right, and didn't get to explore her own likes and dislikes. Mm-hmm. You know, she was forced to wear certain things. She was forced to keep her hair a certain way. I imagine that also extended to things like what music she was allowed to listen to mm-hmm. or, you know, things like that. Okay. Diane left again a couple years later and worked for a man who would end up raping her. Well, after that happened, she went back to Steve. In Anne Rule's book, the author claims that Diane hated sex. This will seem confusing as she uses sex as a weapon most of her life. Courtney, if Anne's claims are true, how does that work? If a person hates sex, and with good reason, as Diane very well may have, how do they then justify using it to get what they want? For Diane and many women who have experienced sexual assault and abuse, Sex is inextricably linked to power. You know, men used sex to dominate and exert power over her. So in response, she is using sex to exert her power over men by using it to get what she wants from them. You know, a person doesn't have to like something to be able to use it as a tool. Diane would leave and come back to Steve over and over again, and she sort of resented resented him for always taking her back, but, you know, she kept going back. She didn't love Steve at all. She didn't care if he was faithful. When they lived together, they may share a bed, but they didn't talk. Diane was getting angry. Her life was not turning out the way it was supposed to. One day, she went to a fair in Arizona where she went by a pro-life booth, and she looked at the literature. So she was overcome by guilt at her abortion. It never seemed to bother her before, but seeing the pictures of what babies look like at several stages of gestation made her regret her decision. She was overcome with, quote, remorse. Diane felt that her aborted baby, who she belatedly named Carrie, was in limbo. She went home and begged Steve to get a reversal on his vasectomy. She was convinced that if she had a baby, it would be like she had not done what she'd done to Carrie. It would right the wrong. Steve refused the procedure, and after a year of being told no over and over again, Diane said she would find someone else to get her pregnant. And that didn't take her long to find a man with whom she worked with to have an affair with her. Steve found out about the affair and was pissed. And when Diane told him later that she was pregnant, Steve knew it was not his. The vasectomy had worked this time. The man who was the father and Steve both wanted her to abort the baby. Diane, of course, refused to do this and was made to, uh, because this was the baby that made up for the baby she had aborted in the first place. Diane felt a sense of real power for the first time. Both of the men wanted something for her and she had the control and she liked this power. Diane had a baby boy who at first Steve was adamant he would not claim, but he fell in love with Danny at the hospital and gave him his last name. They were all living together in an unhappy home. Diane and Steve fought a lot. Physical fights. Diane was also having physical fights with her children. She was angry with them a lot. They did not love her enough or the right way. 
Per the book, quote, Diane had slipped easily into her father's pattern of discipline, but the kids made so much noise and they were always in her way, always breaking things, and they didn't love her, love her nearly as much as they should have. She screamed at them until her throat was hoarse. They tried to duck the blows and ran away, but Diane was fast. She could snake out an arm and catch them easily. Courtney? So what we're seeing here is the cycle of generational trauma and abuse continuing. This, again, comes down to power and control. People, I should say adults, who use verbal and physical violence toward kids, in my opinion, have often confused love and respect for obedience and compliance. They have unrealistic expectations that their children have better emotional regulation than they do and are able to somehow anticipate and do everything that is asked of them before they're even asked sometimes. So for Diane, she was also so focused on her own feelings and needs that she was acting from a place of, well, what makes me feel loved instead of how can we love each other? All right, so... During this time, in the late 1970s, early 80s, surrogacy was a very rare thing. Like, I'm talking about, like, the surrogate mother. There were only about 100 women in the country that were with agencies to help couples have children. Diane learned about the process and decided to throw her hat in the ring. She completed the application and learned that surrogates would receive $10,000 for their services. That's a shit ton of money back then. Yes. I mean, I, I've known someone who's done surrogacy one or two times, and I think she got, like, 40 Okay. Um, that's a lot of work though for it, but anyhow. It so at this time though, it was not like how it is now usually where like they take an egg from a donor and then, you know, sperm from whomever, put it together and then implant it. The surrogate is the mother. So this is, this would be Diane's baby if she was a surrogate. Part of the selection process was psychiatric interviews. The potential mother had to be assessed to be sure that they could carry the baby to term and then hand it over to the parents who paid for the service. And this was the first report um, of her interviews. Quote, there is considerable neurotic, neurotic interplay, both in the marriage and in this woman's total adjustment to life. Because of this one, Diane was set for, sent for further testing, and she scored very high on the IQ tests, proving that she was in the superior range, but she scored lower on tests that involved, quote, social cause and effect, reasoning, attention span, and concept formation. These findings were indicative of major psychopathology. The psychologist was, psychologist was particularly drawn to her score on the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. Diane's responses to the hundreds of questions showed that she did not feel that she was worth very much, that she was not important. Quote, her ego was almost non-existent. The report was somewhat inconclusive. Diane was an enigma. Quote, a clear-cut neurotic picture is not present. Similar individuals display frequent self-deprecation and are seen as very unguarded and without normal social defensiveness. This individual has poor ability to express anger in a modulated fashion and tends to have poor behavioral controls. Despite a flamboyant facade, this woman tends to be shy, timid, and retiring. It was noted that Diane was depressed and she was worried because she did not like sex and she always felt that she was inadequate. Diane flunked. It was thought that she would not be able to surrender the baby. So the surrogate company must have been desperate as they didn't tell Diane she flunked. Instead, they looked for another psychologist to screen her with hopefully a more favorable outcome. The next psychologist kind of parroted what the first said, indicating that Diane was very good at shutting off her emotions when she needed to. He also said, quote, on occasion, she gives the impression of being able to isolate her affect completely. Both psychologists mentioned the diagnosis of histrionic personality disorder. This doctor also had doubts about her ability to give up the baby, but he also thought it might help her get over her guilt of the abortion she had had. Courtney, we talked about this disorder in Randall Woodfield's case, and he will come up again in this case later on. Can you go over histrionic personality disorder, and can you explain why the psychologists feel Diane suffers from this um, and anything else that you see, like why she wouldn't be able to give up the babies, and do you agree with them? So histrionic personality disorder is one of the cluster B disorders in the DSM-5. 
And so in order to be diagnosed, a person has to exhibit at least five of the following traits. So a compulsion to be the center of attention that results in discomfort when unmet, an inappropriate sexual, seductive, or provocative behavior when interacting with others, shallow, rapidly shifting emotions, the use of physical appearance to draw others' attention, dramatic, impressionistic speech that lacks detail, exaggerated theatrical emotional expression, be easily influenced by others or situations, and assumes that relationships are more intimate than they are. So how does this apply to Diane? Well, in response to getting very little attention as a child, she is now basically seeking attention all the time. She is particularly seeking attention from men and using sex and sexuality to get it. The psychiatrist that evaluated her commented on her emotional affect um, and saw some, you know, we saw some evidence early on of those mood swings that she would go from emotion to emotion to emotion. And then, you know, when watching interviews that she's given, like you mentioned, it's very clear that she tries to curry favor by having exaggerated expressions of anger or shock when she's challenged. Um, and her retorts are usually, you know, they use a lot of words without actually saying anything important or useful. She, it sounds like she likes to hear herself talk, is sort of the impression that comes across. Um, and, you know, we haven't seen it as much yet, but as her story continues, we will see evidence of being easily influenced and of thinking that certain relationships are much deeper than they really are. So, you know, in this case, yes, I do agree that the doctors um, were right on when they diagnosed her with histrionic personality disorder. Do people with histrionic personality disorder tend to have low self-esteem? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, kind of in a... Possibly even more so than, like, narcissistic personality. They their sense of worth comes ex almost exclusively from receiving, like, attention from others. And why do you think that they were concerned she wouldn't be able to give up the baby? I think part of it would come from, especially the way that she's described her pregnancies before. We mm -hmm. talked about that a little bit last time, how she was so in love with being pregnant mm -hmm. and felt that those those babies, at least when they were first born, gave her kind of a reason to live and gave her identity and love. And so this being another baby that was, you know, biologically hers mm -hmm. and that she did carry nine months into term, um, giving up this potential source of love, you know, I think could be something challenging. And then one other thing that stuck out to me, I can't remember who we went over with the multiphasic. Do you remember who the that was? MMPI. Yeah. We talked about it in another case and I can't, cause it was familiar to me and I couldn't remember who it was. Do you remember? Oh, I mean, it's not a big deal if you don't, but I was like, I know this, I know this MMPI thing. We've talked about it before. <laughs> I can't remember who yeah. It was. I want to say maybe it was Charles Cullen. But don't quote me on that. I could be wrong. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, so ultimately, Diane was accepted into the surrogacy program. So she is very excited and totally ignoring Steve and has pretty much farmed out her kids to babysitters, including Danny's bio dad, who still had hope that he and Diane may get together and raise Danny someday. If there were no sitters available, she left her kids alone. So they were ages six, five, and 15 months old, and she was leaving them alone. She had a new thing to think about, so her kids and husband were seemingly no longer that important to her. Cheryl got the worst of Diane's behavior. Um, she was the colicky one. Diane seemed to have it out for her as the middle child. I don't know because if it, you know if it was because of how she was as a baby, but people would notice that she was often singled out more than the others by Diane. Cheryl is quoted as, or sorry, um, Diane is, uh, well, that was a Cheryl quote. I apologize. Mm -hmm. Cheryl is quoted as saying this to a babysitter, quote, 
do you have a gun here? And the babysitter said, of course not. Why? And Cheryl said, I want to shoot myself. My mom says I'm bad. Courtney, is this a surprising thing for a five-year-old to say? Yes. And it would certainly be concerning to hear a child that young make suicidal statements like that. Children just don't come up with phrases like that or beliefs that they are bad on their own. They are taught to think that way and are more likely to be mimicking what they heard, what they hear adults say. So Diane probably had told Cheryl these terrible things. Yeah, had probably told Cheryl that she was bad. That she should die. Yeah. Yeah. During this time, Diane was having affairs all over the place. And it didn't make a lot of sense because how she claims to have felt about sex. But, you know, like we said, maybe it's a power play. She also could get things, you know, because of these affairs, and she could call in favors and all that kind of stuff. One man that she worked with said Diane scared him and, you know, it scared him and the way she treated her kids, especially her daughters, horribly. She would also scratch his back so violently when they were intimate that she made him bleed. Regardless of how he felt, he still lent her $5,000 and she never paid him back. In September of 1981, Diane was impregnated with the man's sperm from the surrogacy program. Diane's conceived the first time. She was good at getting pregnant. She was pregnant. Diane was also working full-time at the post office. Because of this, Cheryl would get home from kindergarten and have to wait three hours for Diane to get in or get home and let her in. So most of the time, she just sat on her porch. Or she would go to a neighbor's house asking for food. It got to the point where the neighbor wrote Diane a letter telling her it was dangerous for her child to be alone so young outside for hours at a time. Diane was, of course, angry reading this letter, and she took Cheryl over to the neighbors and said Cheryl was not neglected. Diane would stop by occasionally on her mail route to check on her. She then turned her da- to her daughter and said in front of the neighbor, quote, You're such a bad little girl. If you don't obey mommy, you deserve to be killed. The neighbor and Diane eventually agreed that all three of the children would be babysat by that neighbor. Courtney, uh, what can happen to a child when a parent talks to them this way? Anything else you want to go over? Well, this is clearly where Cheryl got the idea that she was bad and Mm -hmm. didn't deserve to live. And it's just heartbreaking. Children who hear messages like this are very likely to develop depression, low self-esteem, and even suicidal thoughts as we see, right? And the statements would definitely be considered emotional abuse, and leaving a five-year-old alone locked out of the house for hours would definitely be neglect, at least in today's standards, and I would like to think that back then as well. Um, But I'm also confused as to, like, where Christy and Danny were during this time. Christy would have only been in first grade herself, and Danny would have been too young to go to school. They talked about this. Danny was in like a nursery school and because Christy was in first grade, not kindergarten, her school got out later. So it was because Cheryl was like a half day kindergarten kid. Got it. So the other two were at like a school program. Only Cheryl was by herself. Sorry, I should have put that in there, but Mm -hmm. that's where they were. Got it. Um, So I'm flashbacking to when I was little and I went to daycare and there was this little kid. I'm talking, if if my memory serves me right, which is not very reliable, two or three years old. And he's running around hitting himself in the face with his hand, like smacking himself like hard. Is that something like in a situation like this typically happens or is that a totally different acting out type of thing when a kid like is already kind of like self-harming when they're two or three years old? I think, I mean, it could stem from a number of different things. It could be like a a form sort of of like self-harm or self-punishment. If, you know, a kid has already learned that, you know, they're bad, they're Mm -hmm. the bad kid. Um, But it could also be something like, um, like a stimulation behavior, like you might see with someone on the autism spectrum disorder. Okay. Um, Or it could be that they saw someone do it and thought it was funny for okay. a while um so maybe yes uh-huh. but also it could be a multitude of things yes okay well diane even though pregnant was still on the prowl she preferred to, to seduce married men from work in an interview later on she says something to the effect that only half her lovers were married <laughs> like she was bragging only half that only like half of them were married gosh uh in fact Anne rule claimed on an oprah interview that 
you know, Anne had changed several names in her book because so many of the men Diane slept with had not told their wives and she didn't want to, you know, get that out in print. Diane continued to neglect her, neglect her children while she was off having her clandestine affairs, clandestine, clandestine affairs. I write the word. So I read a lot and don't always say the words. So when I say them out loud, sometimes I say them wrong. The children were hungry. They would beg neighbors for sandwiches. They were outside in the cold with no coats, no shoes. They were sick all the time. Cheryl had constant nosebleeds that may have been due to malnutrition. Diane even admitted to her boss at the post office that she had hit her kids harder than she ever had the night before. He just told her to go to counseling, which she didn't. It's frustrating, and I don't know if it has something to do with the times, but so many people knew these kids were suffering, and no one did anything. Diane obviously should not have had kids, you know, even at this point in her life. Courtney? Diane only cares about what Diane wants and feels. Selfishness is a hallmark of histrionic personality disorder. You know, it didn't matter if the men she hooked up with were married and their wives could be hurt. It didn't matter that her her children were hungry, sick, or left unsupervised. The only thing that mattered to Diane is that she was getting the attention and, quote, love that she wanted. You know, being in the line of work that we're in, we are used, you know, we're providing care to young people all day. And we're highly aware of the signs of abuse and the process of reporting it to authorities. But especially back then, you know, quote, like normal people who weren't, you know, involved in working with kids necessarily, where they weren't as informed about what to look for or how to make a report even. And the culture was still more on the side of not prying into someone's personal and family business. So it is awful that these children did not get help any sooner. And, you know, if a concerned neighbor had said something, maybe things could have ended up differently. Right, or if Steve would have recognized what was going on, and maybe he did, and he just didn't care either. I don't know. We don't really get to know Steve that well. No. But if he was beating his wife, who knows if he was also part of beating the children. Yeah. So Diane had the surrogate baby in May of of 1982, she did think about keeping the baby as technically she could have um, in this. I think it was in Kentucky that she was at and she hadn't signed over the rights. It was part of her, but she did honor her contract. And five days after giving birth to the child, she took $10,000 and gave up the rights of the children to the couple she you know, just met at the hospital. She had not known them before. She headed home to Arizona where she was already thinking about the next time she could get pregnant. That's where we're going to stop, unless, Courtney, you have something to add. I think after this is where everything takes a turn from the, yeah, that's sad, to the, Mm -hmm. wow, that's insane. Yeah. She goes too far. Yes. So. All right. Well, like, listen, follow, all of those good things. Email us. Yeah. Questions. Rusty, where are you, Rusty? <laughs> used to be our Facebook person that asked mm. questions, and we haven't heard from you in a long time. All right, well, have a safe week, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Bye. Bye.